Uh, next talk is by uh, Arion Scarapanitsu, who's from Amsterdam, and I'm also uh, as well, so that's why Daniel asked me to uh, introduce him. Uh, because both of us, we organize meetups in Amsterdam about mostly elixir. Um, and today, Arion wants to talk about nerves, because sometimes in his spare times, he likes to toy around with uh, old telephone systems <laughs> and uh, <laughs> those kind of things. Uh, and he also has contributed a lot to, to the elixir community. Uh, um, one thing I also want to mention, like if today, to this evening, you want to have a drink, uh, like chat with, for you probably won't have much less time to talk now. But if you want to find us and have a chat, uh, this evening we're also organizing a meetup at uh, Brewdog, which is in the center of uh, Brussels, at nine o'clock. So if you have time, please find us. Uh, and that with this being said, let's listen to, to Arjan. Give him a big applause. <laughs> Hello, <coughs> hello everyone. Uh, thank you, Tonsi, for the nice introduction. Um, so my name is uh, Arjan Scherpenisse. I'm very honored to be here. Um, and uh, today, uh, well, I work at Bot Squad, which is a company that does things with Elixir and uh, chatbots. Um, but today, I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, but I'm going to talk about basically what is like a hobby project of mine. Um, uh, but still, uh, I think very interesting. Um, so it's about nerves. Um, so let me get the context uh, first, because I uh, I've been working a lot with artists as well to build like interactive installations in my in my past. I did that a lot, and lately I've been using uh, starting to use nerves for that. Um, so one of these projects that basically this whole talk is uh, is about is called uh, Eat Tech Kitchen, which is. Um, it was like an art performance of two ladies who do nice, cool stuff with food and technology. Um, and it was like performance, series of performances, but it was also, or uh, still is, also uh, an interactive installation. So if the ladies are not there, you can still go into the kitchen and then interact with the installation um, and get a nice recipe at the end, uh, which is like a mini performance. And you can, for instance, like eat a bite of in the internet or get some. Uh, so they, they made these like crazy. Uh, food things um, for you to experience. And the way you interact with the installation is uh, through <coughs> this thing over here, Google Home. It's a, a device, you can talk to it, and it will say something back. Sometimes it doesn't make any sense. Uh, <laughs> sometimes it does. Um, and so you s interact with this Google Home device, and it basically, I'm sorry, I have to yeah, send yeah, it within here. OK, yeah, sorry, I'm sorry. Um, just in front of this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you interact with the Google Home, and then the Google Home tells you what to do, and then at the end, uh, it prints a recipe for you, and the recipes are here on the wall, and you, you, you follow the instructions, and then you get your nice food experience. Um, so the way this is set up uh, works like this. Um, a Google Home is connected to the internet, which talks to uh, well, a, a chatbot that, uh, that I've built, very simple one, very basic chatbot. Um, and then uh, eventually it will print something on a, on a printer, wi which is one of these like point of sales thermal kind of simple printers. Um, and of course it needs to do that somehow. So there's a Raspberry Pi here that I programmed to do that. Um, so this, I've been doing things with printers for, for this uh, girl that I work with for quite a lot of time. And the first versions um, that I wrote for this software uh, were in, um, well, it, I just took Raspbian, you know, the Debian distributions for Raspberry Pi. Uh, you, can, you can do a lot, you can install it. You just have basically a mini computer that you can put somewhere, like there's one over here. Um, um, and I needed to somehow interact with this chatbot, which uses Phoenix channels, which is like an interactive way uh, for Elixir and Phoenix projects to talk over WebSocket. Um, so I wrote something in Node.js. Um, and then I also need to, to drive some LEDs uh, because there was some fancy lights. So I wrote some more Node.js. Um, but then I needed to download an image, so I thought, ah, fuck it, I'll just use wget because it's installed, right? I didn't want to learn how to do that in Node. Um, and then I know a bit of Python, so I thought, hell, let's just use Python for printing because the printer driver for Python was apparently better than the one that was in Node written for this thing. But yeah, there was, there, there was a printer driver, so that was good. So it was you know, lunch, a bunch of software stacked together on, on the board. Um, but then suddenly, when it, this was live, I suddenly got a, a phone call. Yeah, sorry, but the, the, the Raspberry Pi broke. Can you come? 
Uh, so um, I needed to go to that place. And it was broken. And it turned out the SD card was corrupt. And what turned out was the SD card, when you unplug the power of, of a Raspberry Pi, um, while it's writing data, um, you basically your SD card is uh, broken beyond repair. It, it, um, so it's really easy to destroy SD cards by just you know letting Linux write to your SD card uh, and then somebody unplugging it. Um, so that's not ideal. So I basically Googled that and then somebody said, yeah, you should use a read-only file system overlay in memory, blah, blah, blah. So um, you know, I typed some more commands. But then also, um, basically then I just had like a read-only version of that software. Um, and every time I unplugged and plugged it, it was back up and it, it restored that version and Linux could no longer write uh, to the file system, which is pretty handy. Um, <laughs> Um, but it also meant every time I need to update the node script, I had to you know, boot again with a special flag and then make the file system rewrite again, blah, 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 and then et cetera. So there's a lot of, lot of stuff. And there was a lot of moving parts. Um, so like a, a year later, when, when, uh, when Klazine asked me again, you know, do you want to do this project again with me? I said, yes, sure, but I'm, I'm going to use a different technology this time. So I need an excuse for a NERF project. So here it was. Um, <laughs> So, uh, who of you don't know what NERVS is at all? Okay, that's quite a lot. Uh, that's good. Um, so, I'm going to give like a very short uh, uh, two-slide primer. Um, NERVS is like a way, uh, it's like an IoT framework, I guess. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> for, for NERVS and other Beam languages. So basically, um, it, it supports uh, devices like the Raspberry Pi and BeagleBone. Basically, any like small Linux device that's not very, very small because if it doesn't have a memory management unit, then it doesn't really work well. So it needs to have like a normal version of Linux that can run, and then you can boot into NERVS. Um, it's not the Linux distribution. It's basically, the only thing that runs on your Raspberry Pi when you use NERVS is uh, the Linux kernel, and then it directly boots into Erlang. So there's nothing in between. There's no systemd, there's no init scripts. Well, there's, there's like, well, there's, there, I think there's one thing in between, but it's like, it's very little. Basically, everything runs within your, within your Erlang virtual machine. So you write all your software services uh, in, in your Beam, and Beam is like your, your container for your whole application and your whole uh, hardware th thing. Um, so that's the only thing that runs there. And it makes it very small. I think if you do the, like the hello world of NERVS, I think the image that you need to flash on the card is like 12 megabytes or something like that. So in that size, so it's very quick. You, you, know, you, you write it, you upload it, um, and then it runs. You configure the network. And it's actually pretty handy to do it this way because you would just have one code base to maintain. You just have your, you know, your software project, you put it on a device, and you know for certain that there's nothing else on that device that you know, can wreak havoc on you. Um, so everything is managed by using Erlang, uh, Elixir, and the Beam, um, where, where like the supervision mechanism of Erlang really replaces a lot of the things that systemd would do normally for you. Um, yeah, and the, the builds are reproducible, so every time you build, you can, you know, you, you are pretty sur sure that it's the same thing as last time. Um, and what's also very handy is that it has an update mechanism, so it has actually two partitions, like an A and a B. So while it's running, you can, you can, it, you can copy new firmware to it, um, and then when the firmware is uploaded correctly, it will reboot to the other firmware. If it doesn't work, it will fall back to the, to the old one. So it has all these you know, nice things for, for small devices built in. Um, and then the last thing that's, that's out there and that's, that's fairly new is the NERVS Hub, which is like a remote man management system. Because you can imagine that if you have, like I, I use this for a hobby, but if you have like you know, hundreds of these devices out there you know, managing sensors for you or whatever, you don't want to you know, don't want to upload those by hand. You want some kind of management system so that you can be sure that some version exists on, on your whole fleet of you know, little devices out there. Um, so Nerves Hub has all that built in and also some cryptographic security so that you really know that it's your stuff and not somebody else's and that nobody can access it, etc. cetera. Um, so with Nerves out of the way, let's see how I uh, implemented this little device. Um, so version two of the Raspberry Pinter was basically, it has these re requirements. Like we needed to join this Phoenix channel, right? Because we needed to get messages from the bot in real time. We need to download that image that we, so the bot would send an image like, hey, print this, please. 
we would download that image and then we would print the, the image on the printer. Um, well, for joining the Phoenix channel, there's of course an Elixir or an Elixir library for it. So that was, was not such a big deal. There's one called Phoenix channel client here. I think there's several others. Um, so for downloading the image file, there's also lots of options because that's just an HTTP request, right? So uh, in case of Tesla, it's also very easy and I think it uses uh, Hackney under the hood, or it can at least. Um, so basically you just get the image and it would just return the body as like raw bytes, the PNG image. Um, so that's also not a big issue. But then now we have the, we have the bytes, so what do we do with the bytes? Um, well, we need to convert it, right? We need to convert it to some kind of thing that the printer understands. And then we need to write that to the printer. Um, so first step, of course, is to, you know, you have a PNG and we need to, you know, get the pixels out of the PNG because we need to decode it into something that was, that it was. And I, um, for the first step, I looked uh, because on the, on the Hex uh, PM website, um, you know, it doesn't seem like a very uh, interesting task, right? You know, load the file and just get pixels out of it. And there are several, actually several libraries that do something like that. Um, for instance, X image info, but no, wait, it only reads the, reads the metadata, so you can see how big it is, you know, what kind of colors it has, I don't know, some stuff, but not the pixels. Uh, PNG, it's an Erlang library, I think, it only writes images, so that's, you know, we need to reverse basically that process. So that also didn't help me much. X magic is like an image magic wrapper, so that's uh, based on a NIF, and NIF is like a C library that is built into, that you can call out to C from Erlang. Um, image ma that looked actually pretty interesting, but it does not expose the raw pixel data either. It just allows you to transform images. Um, so then I stumbled upon Imago. Im I don't know how you pronounce it, and it looks fairly interesting because Imago is a is a is a library. Basically, has a read pixels, and that's exactly what I needed. I needed the read pixels function. You now, get I have a file or whatever. I have a data, and just need you know a size, a width, and a height. You know, list like RGBA, etc. So this is just the raw data. Um, although you know, a list of bytes is not very the, the way to do it in in Elixir because it takes up quite a lot of memory. Um, so you would l probably use a binary for that because you know, binary uh, is just you know a, a chunk of memory basically. Anyway, uh, it, it still could work, right? Because the images are not so so big. Um, so. It turns out it was uh, written in Rust. Uh, I don't have anything against Rust, <laughs> uh, but the, the thing was it doesn't support the latest version of of OTP, uh, and I think NURBS only runs on the latest version of OTP. Or there was some kind of hard problems to 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 do that. There was also quite a lot of you know it, it basically this is an image library, so I'm just gonna you know give me all those uh, decoders. So it was it was it, it went quite big and it. It was. It wasn't. It was. It felt like using a sledgehammer, you know, to cra crack this simple nut. And it turns out, it doesn't quite cross compile to uh, to to nerves. And that was actually the, the the hard thing that I could not figure out because I'm. I mean, I know a bit of C, etc., but I don't know so much about Rust and cross compiling and environment variables and stuff. So. <laughs> Um, and I think everybody, like especially in the Slack nerves channel, agrees that it should be fixed. And maybe it's already fixed. I don't know. Um, but it was kind of hard. And I tried to investigate a bit. And I got into screens like this and more screens like this. And at some point, I was just, <sighs> I just do it myself. <laughs> so I decided to, you know. Uh, look, see if there's because actually wrapping a C library in 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 Erlang and like writing this NIF is not very hard. It's basically just you now taking something and putting some glue on it and then passing it back to the VM. Um, so I looked for like C libraries that were consisted just of one file, right? Those the single header or single files that doesn't have any other dependencies because those you can just easily compile without having to do a lot of dependency stuff. Um, and I, I named this library uh, Pixels. So Pixels basically takes two C libraries, like one's called load PNGs, all, uh, one file, and micro JPEGs, also just one file. Um, and I just linked that to make a, a NIF. Uh, and that way, I uh, finally got you know, my RGBA data. 
uh, as, a, as a byte. Um, and basically right now the only function that it exposes is read file <laughs> because it does no um, PRs welcome of course if you want to write file or whatever I th um, um, so this is actually um, we, we got that problem solved but there are actually two more problems to, to cover how am I doing on time by the way oh okay so I have to speed up a bit I'm sorry <laughs> there's a lot of uh, stuff to tell um, so we need to convert this, this, this raw data into bitmap data and then write the bitmap data to the printer. Um, and printing is actually pretty easy because on Linux, if you just plug in a device, you get, this, you get this thing, this LP device, and just can write something to it and it will just print it out because it's how a line printer works. You just write characters to the, to the device. Um, but if you want to do graphics, like proper graphics, you have to actually read the spec like this. Um, so. I looked at Python uh, because there was a Python library and it turns out it does a lot of stuff and it does more stuff and it basically builds up this hex encoded string and then, and then decodes it to a raw byte and then writes it. I don't know, um, well apparently the easiest. I'm, I'm going to skip over this a little bit because I, I want to do a demo at the end. Um, but basically what bitmap encoding is, is that you take, you know, you take your bitmap and you uh, you know, you put it in, you, 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 you put all these, these different pixels, you put them in one byte. So basically you can, this is, this is like a eight, eight, the width eight. So you can represent that as a list of, you know, um, binary encoded um, integers, which is basically just this. So, so this image encodes to, you know, this raw byte string here. Um, and having said that, Elixir and Erlang have a really nice way of you know, dealing with these bytes. You can really de easily deconstruct bytes and then pattern match on them and also write you know, bit by bit, even not byte by byte, but even bit by bit, you can append things into a new um, a a chunk of memory. So basically that's what this code does. It, it, uh, it recursively goes over the entire input data and it basically decides here <laughs> if it's white or black. Is it, if it's one of the components is larger than 200, it's, it's black and otherwise it's white. Um, and then we just append it here. So we just take the bit string and just append one single byte to it. Uh, sorry, single bit to it. Um, so in the end, you have this nice you know, chunk of data. Um, so now I have this nice chunk of data. Um, but I still need to uh, print it to the printer. It was fairly easy, right? Because we had this nice LP device on the, on the, on the thing. But it turns actually out, um, we cannot really read it. But on NERFs, you don't have these LP devices because there's no printer driver running. Um, and that was actually quite a problem. So I had to resort to use uh, raw, like the libusv data. Is it working? Yeah. And luckily, somebody already made like a libusv wrapper for me. Um, so I used that to, uh, uh, to send that data. And this actually, this, I, I think nobody actually uses this library because it, was, that it is a bit of a sad state and that's, that's really unfortunate. Um, because there was, a, there was some, like, some open things that I, I, had to, I had to fix, like it kept crashing on me. I was like, why is that? Um, I'm just gonna skip over these a bit. But the <laughs> it, was, it, yeah, it, it was not, it was not very, very straightforward. Um, and I still have some PRs open. I hope that the original maintainer hears this talk. Please merge them. <laughs> <laughs> but once I did that, uh, it was fairly easy. I could, you know, I could open the raw USB device and then send my data to it using this uh, bulk send command. Um, and that basically uh, got, my, uh, got my print uh, working. So um, then I only needed to ship it into firmware uh, and put it on the device and then uh, uh, put it into production. So um, this is how my development setup looked. <laughs> <laughs> it's a typical nerves development, you know. You, have your, you need to have a monitor, right? So I have a TV. <laughs> I think this is, the, this is the actual Raspberry Pi connected you know, to the printer and to some keyboard. And I had to move some toys to the side. Anyway, um, and then at some point it started crashing on me and I had to take pictures of the screen. Uh, because it was scrolling so <laughs> so fast that I couldn't <laughs> see what was going on. Um, so it made this nice Giphy for me, although I didn't intend it to do that. Um, 
but uh, with some thanks to the the slack channel uh, i got i got it all working um and um i actually for this talk i actually prepared like a slightly different demo uh, than the the e tech kitchen uh, because um I already made like a hitchhiker's guide quotes voice action on Google Assistant, and I decided to hook it up to the pinner. So let's uh, let's see if it works. Okay, Google, talk to the hitchhiker's guide quotes. Mm -hmm. No. Um, wait, one more time. Okay, Google, talk to the hitchhiker's guide quotes. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we cut that out. Okay, Google, talk to the Hitchhiker's Guide quotes. Nee. Hier zijn de beste zoekresultaten. Okay. <laughs> um, so one, uh, so one, uh, once that uh, that went, it would print out this printer, and uh, well, I, I also did it on my phone. So actually, now it uh, it prints random quotes from the Hitchhiker's Guide. Um, so you can say to the Google Assistant, you can say, hey, print it for me, and then it will, it will actually start to print it for you. <laughs> and there comes another one. <laughs> so you can, you can try it. I'll, I'll need to keep this online so people can you know, print their own quotes. <laughs> um, so uh, what's else there? Um, yeah, so basically the lessons learned here are, I think NERVS is a really powerful framework and it's really, you know, it's really well thought out and it, uh, there's a lot of you know, support for the, for the community. And it gets better every release, like in the last release they released a new networking library um, to uh, automatically set up an access point so you can, you can log into it and then you can configure the Wi-Fi for the device and then it will automatically try to connect to that Wi-Fi so it's really like a smooth, you don't have to hard code the Wi-Fi credentials in your thing like I have to do now. Um, so it, it's really like starting to, you know, to, to be more solid and more uh, more user friendly, and you don't have to use C if you do. And it, you know, there's a lot of support for different for different hardware and different, you know, you know, little boards and LEDs and whatever. Um, but if you know, if you want something specific like I did, you you have to get your hands dirty a little bit. Um, yeah, and there's a very helpful community, um, and there's also a conference coming up actually in the U.S. I think in October. So. Um, so you should go there or send in a paper or uh, anyway. So thank you very much for listening. This is the software, uh, you can uh, find it online. And uh, thanks for listening. Questions? Any questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the question is, uh, does the NERVS have uh, built-in support for the built-in ports of the NER of the Raspberry Pi, like GPIO? Uh, yes, it does. So there's a um, uh, there's a library. I'm not sure. I think Elixir Ale, but I think that's the old one. There's like NERV circuits now. Yeah. NERV circuits. So that support basically for all the circuits, like also SPI and I square C and all those kind of. Um, yeah, those are all supported. So if you have a device that works for like that, it's you just have to write the protocol. You don't have to do any C. <laughs> yeah. Hi everyone. Um, so you showed your development environment, which looks very, very cool. Um, with that new release uh, of the network um, uh, in, in NERVS, because um, I've heard that you can like uh, SSH into NERVS and this oh, yeah. from your laptop. Is that a thing or? Yeah, if I knew the IP address of this thing, I could actually show that. Um, or maybe it's, it's, uh, it's either this one. Ah, there we go. Okay, cool. So this is, I'm now inside that device, basically. So I'm, I'm not sure what it logs. So if I try to do another print, it might, it might show something. Uh, let's, let's just try that. And uh, there we go. Oh, there we go. So it does something. So you see. 
Yeah, so that's that's standard. So you, you you can you can go in, you can debug, you can run code here. Yeah. So you could develop it on your own laptop. Oh yeah, of course. I I all yeah I always develop it on my own laptop. Yeah, yeah. It's basically only like in this situation where you really don't know, you know, if there's a black box and doesn't respond, you don't know in which stage it is it is not booting, right? And then you have to connect the monitor. But for the rest, I can now just upload a new firmware and and just have the reboot, and I wouldn't need to do anything uh, special. Yeah. Did you did you end up using Nerves Hub for the art installation so you didn't have to go there anymore? Um, did I end up using Nerves Hub? Well, I actually tried, but I just had one device, and I actually tried to do that. Um, but there was some issue when I ran into this. <laughs> um, but it was very specific, so the device kept crashing due to some cryptographic error. But uh, I, I would definitely use it. I actually used it, but but for for this, like n equals one, it's not really uh, helpful. Only if you have more than two devices, then it would be really helpful, I think. Yeah. Or if your the installation is remote, right? Because that's also really handy. If your museum installation is a museum somewhere, and you have to, you cannot SSH there. So you, but you can uh, go there through the through the nerves up and then do debug it live. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thanks.